up in this place this morning, God, and we thank you so much that we have been redeemed, Lord, that we get to praise because we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Lord Jesus, by the perfect sacrifice, Lord, that has been paid. We have been given life, Jesus, and more than just that, but we've been given access to your presence, Lord God. We've been given the ability to come fellowship with you, Jesus, to have relationship with you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that this life is so much more, God, more than just our day-to-day life, God, but we have fellowship, communion with you constantly, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, only made possible by your blood, Lord. That's why we sing, that we give praise to you. That's why we give glory to you, Jesus. That's why we give glory to you, Jesus. Oh, Without contention, whose power can't be questioned or contained, with humble faith, he rules the earth and heavens, his glory knows no measure or refrain, and it's bursting past the borderlines of faith. of our
to know your name, to be able to call on your name, to be able to lift our eyes to you and acknowledge you and thank you, giving you worship and praise and honor and glory. We thank you, God, for this privilege that you've given to us and the power, God, behind being able to worship you. Last Sunday, we had a powerful Sunday service. And oftentimes, after powerful moments of worship or prayer or being together like we were last Sunday, sometimes you're weak right off, kind of a lot of attack and a lot of things start happening as soon as Monday starts. And as soon as Monday started for me, I was going from job to job and uh, it just seemed like it was one issue after another. Um, And my list piled up really, really quick with things that were very unexpected. And as I was driving from one of the jobs, I was leaving it and just felt this worry and anxiousness and man, there's just so much I have to take care of and all these things I got to fix. And I just, in that moment, stopped myself and said, no way. This is not how my week is going to go. And the Holy Spirit gave me such peace and I received a word for myself in that moment that I'm not going to worry, but instead I'm going to thank God and give Him my worship. And as I was leaving that job, I had this thought after that thought that my work is not worthy of my worry. Who gave my work the right to take any bit of my worry, let alone my worship, my focus, my peace? Who gave work the right? And I began to thank God and smile as I left that job, that God, you're on the throne, I serve you, I'm, a, I'm in good hands, and I got nothing to worry about. I want us to sing together right now that he is worthy of it all. But this is why. I want you to sing he is worthy of it all. Because we have the privilege, we have the privilege to instead focus and acknowledge and put our trust and hope in him. No matter what's going on in your life with work, no matter what's going on in your life with family or with health, Don't let those things take your worry. Jesus said, will your worry even add a day to your life? We have the advantage not just to not worry, but to worship. We don't just say, God, help me not worry. No, we have the opportunity to worship. When we worship, it begins to deal with our worry. How great is that to us who are his people and his church, that Sunday morning is not just a good worship set. But when you begin to worship God, all of a sudden, everything else must bow its knee and take its place. I want you to sing these words, but at the same time, I want you to tell your worry. Bow to the Lord. Bow to the Lord right now in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, worship Him. We worship you. You are worthy, Lord.
submit all of our worries, we submit all of our issues, we submit the things we're going through to the name of Jesus. Come on, lift up his name. Lord, we acknowledge your name in this place. We acknowledge your name in our life. We acknowledge your name in our situation. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your freedom in this place. We thank you, Lord, for this morning where your mercy is renewed. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be together to hear your word, to be in your presence, to lift up your name. We thank you so much for what you're doing, God. We thank you so much for your faithfulness in our life. We thank you so much, Lord, that you are changing things in our family, changing things in our situation, changing things in the city we live in. And we thank you as we lift up the name of Jesus this morning. We pray that all men would be drawn to you. We thank you for a spiritual shift and change in the city of Vancouver, in the areas we live in, in the neighborhoods we dwell in. And we thank you, God, let your name this morning be lifted up. Let your name this morning be acknowledged above everything else and everyone else. We thank you, God, that it was your name lifted to the highest place. And this morning, your church joins with heaven and joins with our Father in heaven. And we lift up the name of Jesus above every name. We lift up the name of Jesus above everyone. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, shout his name this morning. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Shout the name of Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen, amen. Please greet your neighbor. Tell them it's good to see them in the house of God. Those that are online with us, we greet you as well. So thankful that you are connected with us. And we pray that whatever God has prepared for you, you would receive right where you are. Amen. If you are visiting us or been invited or passing through or just came across us and you're here today for the first time, would you be brave enough just to raise your hand so we can greet you and thank you for coming if you're here for the very first time. Thank you so much for being here. Gentlemen right here in the almost last row. Yep, there he is. My name is George and uh, we're so glad that you are here, and um, this is an amazing church that's not just a building, but is a home to us. Um, I was raised in church, but I came to the Lord through this church at a youth camp when I was 18 years old, and we're so thankful, I'm so thankful with my family and I that attend here, that this is not just a place we attend, not just, not just a place we come on Sundays to join the body of Christ, but this is a place that we call home a place that we have called our local church, and we're so grateful to be here. And for those of you that are visiting um, or not, maybe been coming around the last few Sundays, we pray that if this is your home, that it would become your home as well, that it would not just be a place you attend, but a place that you would grow and be planted in. And the entire church said, amen. amen. We have just some announcements we're going to go through really quick before we have... Um, offering and we collect the offering March 31st to April 2nd we're going to have a 40 hour prayer weekend I just expected a shout and an excitement a 40 hour prayer weekend March 31st to April 2nd you'll get there it's okay you can sign up for a time block uh, if you are visiting especially you think, yeah, I ain't, come, I ain't coming here, man. This church is crazy praying for 40 hours. I can't pray for 40 hours. No, we're not praying uh, individually for 40 hours. We're praying corporately for 40 hours. You are able to sign up for a time block, and you show up for that time block with that team that also signed up for that time, and you'll come for two hours, and then you'll come back again 20 hours later for another two hours. And so at, combined as a church, we pray for 40 hours. We used to do this on a regular basis, and as this year has started and 
has been filled with prayer. Who's been at Tuesday night prayer services? Are you serious? It has been so powerful when we are praying on Tuesdays together as a church. And so we, we believe that this 40-hour prayer weekend is going to be something our church needs and something that is going to be powerful for us to be a part of. And so I encourage you to sign up for that 40-hour prayer. Um, if you've planned something that weekend or have no plans, make this your plan to be here for that 40-hour prayer. It's going to be powerful. That weekend when we do the 40-hour prayer, we're going to start together corporately on Friday night at 6 p.m. and then continue again corporately at Saturday uh, at 6 p.m. So if you're not able to make it for any other time, maybe because of work, you can at least come for the evenings and join us when we have corporate prayer. Um, that following week, we're going to have a good Thursday service. That might sound weird to you because usually we do it on Friday. But on Friday and Saturday is Journey to the Cross. And so on Thursday, we're going to have our good Thursday service. Tell your neighbor, I can't wait to see you on good Thursday. When Jesus died for us that week of Passover, we're going to be celebrating that moment and have a communion together as a church on that Thursday night at 7 p.m. And then, as I said, the next day, Journey to the Cross, Friday night and Saturday night, we've done this event for a few years now, and it has been such a powerful event, not just for our church, but for our community. We have so many people involved in that event. I want to encourage you, if you're not involved anywhere or you want to be involved, this is a great place to start. It's a huge event where there's a lot of different opportunities to serve and be plugged in. And so be plugged in and involved in this event. We're going to believe that through this through that event that we're going to do that weekend, it's not just a show where they go through these different plays and scenarios, but through it we're preaching the message of the gospel, what the whole purpose of Passover and the week of resurrection is about. Jesus died, Jesus rose again, and we believe in him. Paul said, listen, all things I, I forget because of the power of the resurrection and the death of Jesus Christ, desiring to know it even more. And so that weekend we're going to be preaching through Journey of the Cross, Jesus' death and resurrection. And then Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Some churches say Easter Sunday, Easter weekend. We choose to say Resurrection Sunday. We ain't putting no heat on anybody else, but that's what we choose to do because it ain't about bunnies and eggs and egg hunts. It's about Jesus being raised from the dead. That tomb, somebody said that tomb was opened, not for him to get out, but for you to get in. Jesus was raised from the dead and out of that tomb. And when they came to see him and find a dead man, that man was not there. He is a living man. He is living today. And our church is so excited about Resurrection Sunday. And the power of his resurrection, we pray, would be experienced by every person on that Sunday in Jesus' name. So it is It is. A statistic that most people that don't go to church or have gone in church, to church here and there, they come to church on Resurrection Sunday and then also Christmas. Um, and so we want to use this service to our advantage by inviting people through the uh, Journey to the Cross event. And actually on that Saturday when we do the Journey to the Cross event, I'm, I'm saying so many things, just, just please listen to me. On that weekend when we do the Journey to the Cross event, we have a ministry here at church maybe you don't know about called Alki Kids where we reach out to kids in different apartment complexes in our area. And so we're doing a special event on that Saturday, and we're going to tell you about it later when we're going to go out to the neighborhood, gather a bunch of kids here right around the block of our church, and through it, witness to them, love them, give them some food, some candy. It's going to be all legal and kosher, don't you worry. And then we're going to show them show them what that weekend is all about and invite them and their families to journey to the cross and then that Sunday resurrection service. So uh, be a part of that and we'll tell you more about it later. And then uh, y'all, G4T conference is coming up the end of April. Uh, but you know, we're more excited about 40 hour prayer, right, than G4T conference because 40 hour prayer is first and then G4T. What's gonna be the conference? What's, what, what's gonna happen to the conference if we ain't praying? So conference at the end of this month, G4T conference at the end of April. And yes, we are very, very excited about it. Um, when we do that Resurrection Sunday service, the last thing I want to say is we always, on that Sunday, do a special offering. Um, if, if, you, uh, if all you're remembering at the start of this year is a bunch of special offerings um, every other Sunday, this is just going to be a special year. So um, I just want you to get ready because... 
the, the, the house of God is being built. And we, we ain't just believing to finish this house of God. By the way, when we jump in there for youth conference, we're going to start construction right away on this part of the sanctuary, turning it into a banquet hall. Naz and David said, what? <laughs> I said, yes. Um, we're going to be turning this area into a banquet hall. And this is, a, this is such a special year for our church. And I just want to encourage you that in this year, you would not miss your opportunity. If you are following the market and you're following what's going on in the world and you're following stocks and all these things, it's good to know that stuff and be educated and be wise with what we're doing with our finances. But can I say that in the times where financial things are hard for the world, they are not so for the church. This is the opportunity that we have as the people of God to actually prosper, to give, to sacrifice, to believe, to see miracles. That when somebody runs into you at the construction site, they're like, hey, why aren't you worried? Why aren't you scared? Why are you building? I'm building because God said we're going to build until he comes back. And so I'm building in Jesus' mighty name. We're not just building this church. We're believing for more things and more buildings and more properties that God is going to give us in this next season. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Listen, when everybody's blessed and doing well, what's the difference that the church is doing well as well? But when everyone's panicking and having a hard time financially, but the church is growing and prospering, let that be a sign to this world that the God we serve is not just the president, is not just watching our economics, but owns everything that is in this world, and we trust him. And just quickly before I invite David to share offering, one of the most difficult financial years that we were having as a church, our pastor at the start of that year received a word that at this year, we're going to not just barely cover our mortgage, we're going to pay double on our mortgage. And everybody said, what? We're gonna, we just need to pay the mortgage, pastor. <laughs> he said, no, we're not just going to pay the mortgage. This year, as hard as it is, we're going to be paying double. And we started, we just came in agreement, we prayed, and we began to see God supernaturally provide month by month as our church was giving and sacrificing and people were obeying God. And that entire year until this day, we just continue to pay more and more off of our debt and see that debt decrease and to God be all the glory. So this year, I just encourage you, encourage you as if you keep hearing special offerings, let it be an opportunity to you to continue trusting God and sacrificing and just watch what God does in your life. Amen. Please help me welcome David Wadabitz. Hello, hello. Well, I'm just going to continue what, the, uh, what George has started with offering. I'm going to add some, some of the word of God. Let's turn to Matthew 6, 25. And this is just following the theme of what the Lord has already been speaking today. And honestly, from worship and what George was sharing, this is, it's, it's so awesome when, there, when you just see a thread uh, it says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat and what you will drink, nor about your body and what you will put, or what you will put on. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet you, uh, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious, anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. Come on, just tying along with everything that kind of has been going on, I just felt such a strong urge uh, as I was just preparing, preparing um, uh, just for even what to even share, that God is a God through all of scripture from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God, there's a theme that God wants his children, 
his people, his nation from the Old Testament, his now sons and daughters, those that are redeemed by the, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, to trust in him. Amen? All throughout the Old Testament, you see God coming through for his people. You see him um, taking Israel um, out of Egypt. You see uh, him leading uh, the, the, the nation uh, through uh, trials and trials and revealing himself over and over again uh, through thousands of generations that he is faithful, he is good, and he is there for his people in Joshua 4, we read that God told Joshua as they were crossing, as they were taking the Ark of the Covenant through the Jordan River, it says that God made it like dry land as they were crossing through. And after they crossed through, God told Joshua, grab 12 men from each tribe, may, uh, have them grab a stone and bring it into the camp of Israel so that when the future generations Look at those rocks. What do they see? They see the faithfulness and the power and the, that, that the fear of the Lord may come upon them for them to see what God has done for them. Amen? Amen. To see what God has done for them. And even just step, um, talking even what George was saying, when, when the world is going through chaos, but there's people that are rooted on something that is greater than what this world has to offer, like it says there in Matthew, how the Gentiles seek after these things, but God says to us, God says to his cho chosen children, he says, no, I know what you need. I will take care of you. Amen? So I just want to encourage each and every single person here, no matter what the world looks like, no matter what's going on in the world, we have a foundation that is greater, that is stronger. And I just pray that this morning we may rest on the promises of what the word of God says, that our heavenly father knows what we need. And you know, sometimes we think that we know what we need, but God says, no, that's not what you need. I know what you actually need. You may, there may be things that you want, and you think that those things are going to uh, make you feel uh, prosperous. Those things are going to make you feel secure. Those things are going to make, um, make, make you feel secure, but God says, no, I know what you want, not what you need. And sometimes what we need is not what we want. And I just pray that this morning, as we just open our hearts, as we give, as we sow, that the promises of God, that the things that we need, our Heavenly Father knows. And that may he just draw our hearts closer. May our ears be open. May our hearts be open and our ears hear what those things that we need, and, and just as the Holy Spirit speaks, as he leads us, as he guides us, may we just be intentional and be able to be fruitful in all those uh and all the things that the lord is speaking to us in in response to what he's doing i pray that our souls this morning may find peace in what the word of god says that as he feeds the birds and clothes the fields that we have an assurance that our heavenly father knows all the things that we need as god has shown his miraculous hand through the thousands and thousands of generations may we rest assured that his miraculous hand is still at work today. I pray as we sow this morning that every seed will be a blessing to the body of Christ, to this church, to the body of Christ all around the world, and that may God use this offering to reveal his greatness in each and every single one of our lives. Amen, church? Can we just bow our heads and just begin to thank him? Usher team, if you could just come forward. Jesus, we thank you for life, God. We thank you that through your death, Lord God, your resurrection, you have given us life and life abundant, Lord God, a joy and a peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord God. When the world says one thing, God, we can come and we can stand on your word. We can stand on your promises and we can rest in what your word says, Lord God, that you know all things, Father God. And I just pray for each and every single person, Lord God, as we sow, as we give, God, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you just multiply the seed. May it be a, a blessing to the body of Christ, Lord God. May 
People that are believing for a miracle, receive, Lord God. For those, Lord God, uh, that, that are just in need, Lord God, I pray that your gracious and loving hand, Lord God, be stretched across, Lord God. We just thank you. We love you for what you are doing, Lord God. We stand in faith that we know, Lord God, that you can do all things, Lord God, and we just trust in you this morning, and we just thank you for joy, peace, and the Holy Spirit, Lord God. We love you. We bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Can we just welcome Alex Maximov as he comes to preach the word of God this morning? Uh, good morning, beloved sons and daughters of God. Um, let me get this guy going. How's everyone doing? Happy Sunday. <laughs> All right. Well, when I was a kid, my dad would love to take us to the beach. And I think for him it was... Besides just wanting to spend time with his kids, I think he actually really loved the beach. He still does. Uh, maybe it was the roar of the waves that brings some sort of peace or the never-ending sand under his bare feet or the, the cool breeze. This is the Oregon coast, after all. For me, though, as a kid, it was all about the adventure. So whether it's making the sandwiches, hopping in the minivan, driving out there, and then digging to the other side of the world. And if I couldn't on those rare occasions, right, then I would try to build something. And whatever I would build, I would try to make sure that I could build it so well that, you know, I kind of time where the waves are, how, how far they come in, and I try to build it to the point where maybe the waves don't knock it down. And we'd get creative. We'd build our castles, and then we'd maybe make moats around the castles so that when the waves come in, we kind of redirect the water, you know, so it doesn't knock down the castle. But eventually, for all of you who've played in the sand, you, you realize that there's always that one wave that just comes in, you don't expect it, and it tears everything down. It doesn't really care about my little, you know, eight-year-old moat. So it kind of starts to remind you that really, this is all just sand after all, right? Jesus had a parable to help illustrate a point, and that's where we're going to be this morning. And it has something to do with building in the sand. Uh, before we get into the text, I'd like us to pray. Um, I feel a, a certain heaviness on this text this morning, and I just want to make sure that we ask the Spirit of God uh, to reveal to us his ferocious love. So if we could bow our heads. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the family of God. Thank you that you've placed our feet on solid rock. Father, I'm just so thankful that we get to open up your word. We get to get together. We get to worship God. Thank you for everything you've done that you've rescued us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved Son. I pray, Lord, that this text this morning would encourage believers by your spirit to draw near to you. And may we see everything that is said this morning through the lens of your ferocious love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we'll be primarily in Matthew 7 this morning. So the Gospel of Matthew is, is a biography uh, about Jesus' life. And the earliest tradition dates it to uh, the disciple Matthew, who was a tax collector and eventually became an apostle of Jesus. So this is a, a story on Jesus' life, and it's written from one of his apostles. And a primary theme in the Gospel of Matthew is the announcement of the kingdom of God is at hand, or in Matthew's language, the kingdom of heaven is near. And so Jesus in Matthew's Gospel delivers five major teachings, and the first major one he delivers is typically called the Sermon on the Mount. Oftentimes scholars will look at these five teachings and, and see them as you know, a fulfillment of the five books of Moses in the Old Testament, because Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, but... Another sermon is just interesting. Okay, so the Sermon on the Mount goes from chapter 5 to chapter 7. And before I say anything else, I want to make something abundantly clear. I am walking attention this morning, theologically speaking, because I'm trying to... These passages on the one side have been used uh, to basically guilt trip people into legalistic action, legalistic obedience. And it turned out that, you know, when you do that so much... It's not really a heart change, it's a gospel of sin management. But on the other side, I've seen these very same passages be used to basically say it really doesn't matter what you do. It's all about believing in Jesus. And I would suggest that both of these views aren't actually consistent with the text at hand. They're missing the larger picture, and Jesus has so much more for us than that. And so, time for a little bit of context. So there's a distinction drawn this distinction is drawn in chapter 5 and chapter 6, and it kind of continues on. Uh, remember, we're, we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And this distinction contrasts between two different types of people. And so Jesus is saying, look, 
there's those who give to the needy in order to be noticed. That's where their heart posture is. And then there's those who give to the needy in how we are to give quietly, right? He makes a distinction between those who pray to be seen and those who should pray in secret, and their father will reward them in public. Gives a distinction between those who fast for these reasons to, in order to be publicly noticed, and then there's people who fast and they don't even want anyone to know. And so, oftentimes, this keeps coming back, or well, every time, it keeps coming back to the motivation of the heart. And then, finally, there's a distinction being made between those who lay treasures on earth and those who lay treasures in how we should lay tre- treasures in heaven. Notice the heart posture keeps coming back. And he, this, this pattern seems to continue throughout this first sermon of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. And so we're going to jump in at chapter 7, verse 15. And there's a contrast there even between a good tree bearing good fruit and a bad tree that must bear bad fruit. And so keep that in the back of your mind. But what I want to suggest so far is that your heart posture, your actions naturally follow your heart posture. So uh, chapter 7, verse 15, uh, and to the end. Watch out for false prophets, those who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Strong words. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, and I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. What a way to end a sermon, right? <laughs> and you see this, this uh, dichotomy once again come back. There's a person who builds the house on a stone or on a rock, and there's a person who builds their house on sand. And so many have called Matthew uh, 7, 21, this, the scariest verse in the Bible, the devastating, heart-wrenching words, I never knew you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, but those who do. More than a profession of faith, even though the profession of faith is what saves us. Which, what's Jesus' reason here for having never known them? That's a, pretty, that's a pretty heavy thing to say. Well, the verse says, I never knew you. And it's followed by you evildoers, or depending on your translation, you workers of of iniquity, or you who practice lawlessness. Please hear me. I am definitely not saying that we're saved by our works. We're saved by grace through faith, apart from any works of law. Nobody can boast anything else would be a false gospel. What I am saying is that your actions will demonstrate whether or not you actually believe in the first place. And so, George actually recently said a few weeks ago... um, the will, with willing faith, there is action, um, which is part of my point today. But do you know what dead faith looks like that actually doesn't save? Um, the, uh, the, the letter of James in chapter 2 explains that really well. There's no action. That's how you know when you have dead faith that doesn't save. You guys doing good? Okay, so here's the journey. I want to kind of tell you guys where I'm going today. So First, I'm hoping to demonstrate the absolute necessity for obedience in the life of every believer and that it is a non-negotiable. And then I'm hoping to try and answer the how question. Uh, So let's get into it. Uh, My first major point is that obedience actually equals lordship. Obedience equals lordship. The question becomes, who is your lord? So maybe you're in this room and uh, you're not really on board with Jesus. We're actually just so glad that you're here. Thank you for trusting us. Um, 
And the word Lord is foreign to you. Maybe you're like, I don't really need to submit to some Lord. I like to make my own decisions and my own actions, and I kind of want to make my own destiny and do what I want. My suggestion to you is you're not actually free until in New Testament language you die to yourself. And on the other side of that, you find his lordship to be beautiful. The suggestion, yeah, so there's still a Lord in your life, no matter who or what it is. The difference is, if he's not Jesus, then whatever you're living for has promises that, that it's telling you. And those promises are about as empty as the tomb that Jesus walked out of when he died for you. And so the invitation for you today is to give over, to, to submit to Jesus' lordship and find true freedom. Because honestly, we all have a lord, whether it's Jesus or not. What do you live for? What brings your life purpose? What do you, what do you see when you look at the future, what do, you, what do you want to accomplish in this lifetime? It's good to have goals, ambitions, dreams. Those are all very good things. But at the end of the day, what drives you to get to those goals? What, what gives your life meaning? Whether intentionally or accidentally, we're actually all building. We're building on something. We're building some sort of structure in this life. See, obedience to Jesus is a demonstration of his lordship in your life. So if you considered him your savior you can't help but consider him your Lord. So how do I know if he actually is Lord? Well, do I care about what he has to say in order to let it affect my life? When I'm faced with a decision, do, do, do his words actually mean something to me? Does it influence my desires? If we have zero desire to submit to Jesus' Lordship, no desire to obey his word, no desire to even want to love him, I'm, I don't think he's your Lord. <laughs> And so if he, if he is not your Lord, I'd be very careful about whether we even accepted him as our Savior. Lord, Lord, didn't we do X, Y, Z? When faced with a decision, are we trying to align what we do to what we think Jesus would want us to do? Do we even ask that question? Do we even try? It's a very good way to know if he's actually your Lord or not. This is a, this is a vital issue. The fruit of repentance is how we treat the Lordship of Jesus in our heart and then in our actions. And so to build on the rock is the call. And to, in the end, to hear, well done, good and faithful servants. Here's the thing. It is possible to do good things without Jesus being Lord. Though the fruit of the, what you do ends up being rotten because you end up being a bad tree bearing bad fruit with the wrong motives. And, and in the, end, and in the end, end with destruction. But it is impossible to not do good things if Jesus is Lord. That fruit will naturally follow. Think about Jesus' words. I think it was John. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Because without me, you actually can't do anything. And so if you do good things with a bad heart, eventually you'll do bad things. Look at the lives of the Pharisees, for example. They went from trying to obey the law. They went from doing it as best as they knew how. They went to try and make everybody do it as well. And in the end, they ended up murdering Jesus. That's a pretty bad end. You know what I mean? Theologian Dallas Willard said this. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to learning. Oh, sorry, earning. <laughs> earning is attitude. Effort is action. Earning is attitude. Effort is action. He's basically saying that grace is not opposed to your actions. We did not earn salvation but we are applying effort in our actions because we are saved. So here's what I found fascinating about this story, the rock and the sand. Both of these people heard the words of Jesus. It's, this isn't a dichotomy between like, oh, they've never heard, or he didn't understand Jesus, or he just didn't know the gospel. No, in this story, both of them hear the words of Jesus, because Jesus says, of those who hear my words, right? And so the parable has a person who heard, and another person who heard. This person decided to actually obey Jesus and submit to his lordship, but this person decided to do life his or her own way, and the latter ended in destruction. See, the God who created all things, including you and I, knows the best way for us to live. The psalmist describes the law this way. He says, I love your law. He describes God's statutes as the joy of his heart. When was the last time we were like, Lord, your, your obedience is the joy of my heart. It gives him, for the psalmist, it gives him direction. It gives him a strong footing, a solid foundation. Our obedience to his loving guidance is the only evidence of his lordship, sorry, is not only evidence of his lordship in our lives, but it's actually the best way for us to live. Because quite honestly, 
disobedience and sin will take us further than we've ever wanted to go. But his ways are good. The call this morning is for willing and joyful obedience to trust him with our heart and then follow that with our actions. We can trust him with our lives. The question then for us this morning is, am I building my foundation on Jesus? Is he Savior and Lord, or have I professed something and I don't live it? Jesus said in Luke, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do as I say? If you've truly received Jesus as your, as your Savior, you will want to obey him as your Lord. It just naturally follows. But sidebar, if, if you have received Jesus as your Savior and you're struggling to obey, I don't want you to start to doubt your salvation. <laughs> Give me a few minutes. Um, when I make decisions, though, do I have his words in mind? Our fruit and our obedience are visible markers if our faith and relationship with Jesus are real, is real or not, whether we actually believe or if we're deceiving ourselves. The scariest thing about these verses, in my opinion, is that, both of, is that these people that came to Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, they actually thought, they seem to have actually thought that they were, they were right, that they were good. And, you know, we, we did all these things for you. We did all these things in your name. And, and the response, the shocking response is, I never knew you. One way to understand knowing, this I never knew you, one way to understand knowing in Hebrew literature, um, is kind of like an intimate thing. It's, it's an intimacy. It, it could be intimacy language. Think about this. Adam knew Eve, and she bore a son. This was more than a coffee day. Just... In Amos, God says, only Israel had I known. And so when you hear, I never knew you, it's almost like we never had a relationship. Like you were doing all these things, you thought you were doing them for me, but you weren't doing them for me, you were doing them for you. Think about the dichotomy and the immediate context of chapters 5, 6, and 7. You have this person doing it for this reason, and you have this person doing it for this reason, right? The context is the clarity here. You weren't doing them for me. We are once again coming back to the posture of the heart, the Sermon on the Mount. A surrender to his lordship. A good tree bears good fruit. Actions follow heart posture. Actions follow heart posture. All right, I want to do a map check for our journey so far. If Jesus is my savior, he must also be my lord. Okay? If he is not my lord, oh, he is not my lord if I don't find a heart posture that's willing to obey his word. And if this is the case, then he doesn't know me. So many of us have this desire. We have a desire to live a life of holiness, to answer the call, to live a life of faith, a life of obedience, a life of submission to his lordship. So the question becomes how, right? It becomes how. And I think the how question is probably just as vital as everything else here. So... I want to talk about motivations for sustained obedience. And the two I want to focus on is faith and then primarily love. So have you guys ever signed up to the gym? And maybe I'm just talking about my own life here. But have, have you ever signed up to the gym and then you're like, this is it. I, I'm counting my calories. I'm going to get shredded in like six months. This is like, this is it, you know. Like I'm going to go to the, the, the highest like, you know, whatever. And, and I'm going to, you know, pay all this money. And you're like, okay, here's my plan for the next six months. Let's go. And then you get into the gym. Uh, you work out once. You work out twice. You're like, I'm going to do 5 a.m. Before, before work, you know. And then uh, a few weeks in, you're like, that bag of Cheetos doesn't look so bad. You know, and all of a sudden, you start to like, oh, I haven't been in the gym this week. But it's okay because, you know, I, I walked around the block. What happened? Like, you were so motivated in the beginning. Am I alone? I mean, I don't know. Well, you were so mo There you go. You were so motivated in the beginning. Or, or what about this one? You come to church on a Sunday morning, you hear the word of God proclaimed, and it hits you. Something happens in your heart, and you're like, this is it. I am going to, like, you know, I'm going to save my neighborhood tomorrow. It's Monday. On by Wednesday, I'll resurrect three people. Let's go. And then Thursday rolls around, and you're yelling at someone in your car because there's a middle, like, you're in road rage, you know? And you're like, oh, I haven't even thought about Jesus since Monday. What went wrong? In James, in James chapter 1, <clears throat> we have this, uh, this picture. Verse 22 through 20, um, well, yeah, 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So imagine you're getting ready for church. You look in the mirror. You're a mess. 
and you're like, all right, and then you just go to church, and you're like, oh, I forgot, you know. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. There's hearing something, there's knowing something, and that's not the same thing as wanting to do it or motivation. But even that is still not the same thing as doing it, right? So we can, be, we can hear something and we can receive it. We can move that into a, 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 an area of motivation in our lives and we might want to do it. But that's still not the same thing as actually doing it, right? It can be a process. So how do we address or fix it? Well, it's interesting that in, in Matthew, Jesus actually says, those who hear my words and put them into practice. So sometimes a continual sol- surrender to Jesus as Lord takes practice. And there's two things I want to mention. Um, keep that in your mind. And again, that's faith and love. So let's start with faith. The Greek term for pistis is, uh, sorry, for faith is pistis. And pistis can be very easily translated as trust. And so kind of like, you know, Abraham believed God. He trusted what God had to say. It was credited to him as righteousness. And so in Romans 15, you have this language where it says obedience that comes through faith. So trusting the character of God is trusting that he knows better than me. And so I want to obey someone who knows better than me. If I'm following a general, and I'm a, let's say I'm, in, I'm in, in a war, and I'm a brand new soldier somehow, and I'm following the general into an army, I'm going to want to make sure the general has been to war before, right? And then I'm going to follow him, because like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to trust him more than I trust myself. And it's kind of like that here. Do we actually trust God? Because see, sometimes... Trusting Jesus looks like having two decisions in your life. Maybe more, but two decisions in your life. One of them is right, and the other one is like almost right. And so the goal there is to ask, what does Jesus actually say about this? Or what does his character as revealed in the scriptures want me to do in this situation, right? And so we we make a conscious decision to do that which our Lord would have us do. And this is a joyful submission because we trust him. And so... There's a practice I've incorporated into my life as well. Like if, if, I'm, if I'm faced with a decision or how to respond to someone or, or something along those lines, sometimes I want to do it a certain way, and I'm like, it's technically, is it sinful? I, I mean, probably not, but does Jesus want me to do that? Also, probably not. And so I have to kind of face the fork in the road and make a decision. So we make decisions of submitting to Jesus as Lord or not. So how would Jesus want me to respond to my spouse? Or how would Jesus want me to raise my kids? How would Jesus want me to treat my employer or my employees? How would Jesus, my, if he is my Lord, want me to treat my neighbor? Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Because he is. And so it then becomes our choice to say, God, I choose to trust you here. Even if I'm not entirely sure, or even if I, in my own mind, disagree with this application, I trust you because you know better. And if you're struggling to obey, please receive this well, but maybe it's because you don't actually believe. Maybe it's because you don't actually trust him to be your Lord. Maybe you don't believe that he has the best for your life. Do you actually trust him to be your Lord? Or are there hang-ups? How do we change that? How how do we get, I mean, how do we go from that to this? I'm not talking about white-knuckling obedience because, you know, we feel like we have to. How do we change that motivation for sustained obedience throughout our life? Well, we have to get to know him more. By getting to know the Lord more, we actually trust him more. Because the more of himself that he reveals to us, the more we see how beautiful Jesus actually is. His character, his lordship his call, his mercy, his grace in our life, his patience and long-suffering with us, his love. He's never going to leave or forsake us. And that's the Lord that we're submitting to. We have to remember, this isn't some distant, foreign thing. He's a good shepherd. So the motivation here is to trust him because he is a good shepherd and what he's already done in our lives. And also, practice, practice, practice. Again, Matthew 7, those who hears my words and and puts them into practice or does them. What if taking those steps, the practicing those steps of obedience, actually help us to solidify Jesus as Lord in our lives? What if with every step that we choose the right decision because we think, you know, this is what Jesus would have us do, we actually add another brick to the house on the rock? What if 
You see, trusting him is one thing, but even deeper than that is actually loving him. Mother Teresa once said that the fruit of faith is love. When we know from Galatians 5, I'm not going to read it, that it's definitely a fruit of the Spirit. And so my second motivation for obedience is actually love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? My main point here is, who has your heart's affection? In 1 John uh, chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, 3 through 5, uh, it says this, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. How do we know that we, we've come to love him if we keep his commands? <laughs> Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love of God is truly made complete in them. Remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, especially when he's talking about treasure? Um, it was right before, yeah. So when he's talking about treasure, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So who has your heart? Who has your heart's affection? Maybe this, the, the reason that some struggle to submit to his lordship, and all of us struggle with that from time to time, if we're honest, is we actually are missing that love and affection for Jesus. Maybe there's our love, and we forget that, how much we actually love him. Because see, love equals lordship as well. And so what we love in our hearts eventually influences our actions. There's actually psychological data to back this up as well. I checked. And apparently, what we love in our heart has a far greater influence on how we act than how, what we actually know in our mind does. What we love in our heart has a far greater influence on how we behave than what we know in our mind when it comes to motivation. And we are emotional beings. God created us that way. Our issue isn't that we don't love anything, it's that oftentimes we're fi finding ourselves loving the wrong things. So there's a real danger in loving false things. Lord, Lord, in your name we X, Y, Z, but where was their heart? What's striking is these people seem to believe that they know him based off what they did in his name, but have they submitted to him as Lord or were they just taking his name in vain? Would, why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do as I say. We can do ministry, we can do worship, we can serve uh, the poor, the needy, the orphan, all these things are very good. We can even open our mouths and acknowledge him as Lord, but do we actually submit to him as Lord? Because that's a different question. We can become functional idolaters while appearing to serve God and not even realize it. And all of that is tied to the affections of our heart. So Jesus is not looking for an empty, white-knuckled, submissioned obedience because you have to. He's after your heart, your trust, and your joyful submission, and then the action naturally follows. So do I love something more than Jesus? What is that thing? Does it drive my life? What gives my life actual meaning and purpose? What, if the first, what is the first thing on my mind when I wake up and when I go to sleep? I actually, in my own life, I started incorporating this, this thing where if I wake up and I have a bunch of texts from work, even if they're calls, uh, I try not to pick up or answer or respond until I at least have a little bit of time just recentering my mind on Jesus' lordship in my life. I just thank him for the day and I ask him for his help and guidance. And even that little, little, little thing, you know, can, can already start to redirect your heart's affections. Not into, you know, I wake up and I, you know, I live for work, but I wake up and here's, here's Jesus. You see, because whatever I love more than Jesus usually becomes my Lord, and I will live for it. We're emotional beings, but there is hope. You're not alone. Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, keep my commands. If we continue reading that same passage from verse 16, you have this, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. He continues to make this point if we keep reading, but the point here is we have his spirit to, to give us our heart's affections for Jesus. We're not alone. Do you struggle to obey? Perhaps your heart's affections need to be aligned. Ask, pray, seek, you'll find. And then drive deeper into his word and grow in your love for Jesus. The fact 
that you have a strong conviction to obey, even if you're falling short, is a very good sign. He's given you a new heart. He's given you a right spirit. And he's given you his affection. Philippians 2.13, we have this encouragement. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Other translations will say he gives us the desire and the ability to do that which is right. Ask. 2 Corinthians 9.8, I know I'm kind of jumping around, but... It says this, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. This is the blessing of God to abound in every good work. It's done by his power through his spirit and with the right motivations and affections of our heart. You're not alone in this. Abounding in every good work is something God empowers you to do. This is, there's beauty in his lordship and no other Lord offers this. There's no security anywhere else except for in him. And obedience, while necessary for the believer, should always follow a posture of the heart. Otherwise, it's legalism and it won't produce the right fruit. It just won't. You're not saved by works, but your obedience naturally follows salvation. Obedience is a natural fruit in faith in Jesus as Lord. So Jesus makes you a good tree, bearing good fruit. And abiding in Jesus brings forth this fruit. Please hear me here. The tension I'm walking this morning is to encourage us as the family of God to be passionate about our submission to Jesus as Lord in the way that we act, live, think, treat one another while affirming our identities as beloved children of a gracious God who loves every person in this room much more than I can ever describe through this microphone. God is with us in our desire and our ability for our obedience. He never leaves us alone in this, even when we face the storms in this life. And the truth is, we weren't actually promised a storm-free life. You see, the problem of pain and suffering be a central theme in the book of Job. For the book of Psalms, one of the main overarching themes is uh, it's a Hebrew word, chesed, which basically means God's unending or unfailing love throughout all of life's circumstances and situations. Jesus said, in this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I've overcome the world. You look at the way that the disciples lived their lives. You know, um, in December, the beginning of December of last year, my wife and I were uh, visiting Manhattan with some of our really good friends. And we were making our way, it was already late at night, we got on the subway, we're making our way north, back up to Times Square from the financial district. And I get a call on my phone And uh, the family that we have that was watching my son Ezekiel, who was was two, uh, asked for insurance information, (laughs) medical insurance information. I'm like, okay, naturally it's like, why? And reassured me everything's okay. And then um, we were losing service, so it was kind of shady. And and then I got off the call and I checked the the camera, the doorbell camera I have in my house, to see a paramedic running into the house and an ambulance out front. Now, we're, it's late at night. There's no planes leaving all night. I've never understood the need for a private jet until that moment. But if you're you're a father or a mother, you can only imagine how that feels like. I'm like, is he alive? (laughs) Like, what's happening? And the knot in my stomach made me want to throw up, and everything just kind of went blurry. I basically just trusted my friends to get me back to the hotel as I just kind of followed. During this time, thank God everything's okay. Many of you prayed. That's a whole nother testimony. Um... But during that time, I was actually studying the Psalms pretty deeply, and I was trying to lean on God's chesed, his unfailing love throughout life's circumstances, as best as I could. And in those times, our trust gets tested, doesn't it? Needing to control everything is an, an endeavor that slips through our fingers like the sand that we're building with. And so, it's not ready for a storm, much less a slight wind in this life. The immediate context doesn't seem to be talking about storms of this life, but to make the point, we live in a very reactive culture, don't we? Oftentimes we react rather than be proactive. We don't think often about what we're building on until something shakes it. And maybe you're going through something and it's okay to grieve, it's okay to lament, it's okay to ask God why. All of that is normal. Get around community and have him encourage you. But there's also a little bit of grace in the storms of life because it gives us an opportunity to examine our foundation and see if there's cracks in it. And so it's an opportunity to reevaluate and avoid the ultimate destruction in the end that Jesus warns about in his parable. The wind blows, the waves come, 
And those who are building on sand will see a fall. But those who build on the rock by obeying the word of Jesus will stand. So the question for all of us, including me today, is which builder are you? Could we all stand? We're going to go into a time of prayer. We're saved by grace through faith. Obedience doesn't save us, but the fruit of our life is a sign of our salvation or our lack of it. A couple more thoughts and and we're going to pray. In the parable, two people heard the word of God, but one followed it with obedience and the other one didn't. Our obedience determines who our Lord is, and everyone obeys or lives for someone or something. Trusting and loving Jesus will propel you into obedience to his word. And that's the best place to be when the storms of life hit. That's the only way we're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, and that determines if we actually believe that Jesus is our Lord or if we're serving another Lord in our life. There is, if, if there is no desire, no desire, I'm not talking about perfection here, if there is no desire of, fruit, of, of the fruit of obedience in your life, I want to lovingly challenge you and plead with you to examine your heart this morning and see if there's any idols there in places where Jesus should be. The invitation of a loving, compassionate, and gracious God this morning to you is to run into his open arms. Trust his love completely. Trust his lordship. If he's your savior, he needs to be your lord. Put him first. Seek him with all your heart. He's not far. He's already waiting for you. Allow his love to drive you towards repentance and submit to his lordship. Because maybe by his mercy, God is calling some of us this morning to take his words more seriously. Maybe it's to pray and to desire that ability to do that which is right. Maybe it's more than just we physically do or don't, but it's what's hidden in our hearts. So really, I want to talk to four groups this morning that, that I had on my heart. Maybe you're not sure what foundation you've been building on. And I want to ask you to seek the Holy Spirit's guidance in that. Come forward when we start to pray. We'd love to pray with you. And ask to reveal the motivations of your heart and align your heart to faith and to love in your Lord. Maybe you're just, you're just tired. You're tired of the struggle. You're tired of trying. You're tired of fighting. I would suggest that maybe you have the wrong motivations in your heart and to reevaluate those motivations and make sure they're centered on the right things. Again, he gives you that desire and that ability and come to him. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He gives you rest. In your obedience, Jesus gives you rest. Tell me any other Lord that does that. And maybe you're in this house and you're getting hit by a storm right now. Maybe your house uh, is being hit by some waves. We'd love to pray with you. The storms of life come and go. Jesus remains your Lord. He's a good shepherd who will guide you through them. And then finally, maybe you're realizing that your profession of lordship to Jesus has been superficial. Maybe you're realizing that, yeah, I worship him and I call him my Lord, but I don't actually believe him as Lord in my heart. The call of Jesus is the same today as it always was. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Follow him as Lord. The call for you this morning is to come back to his lordship, return to the good shepherd, and begin to trust his love completely as the spirit helps you do so. So Jesus doesn't say admire me, right? He doesn't say listen, you know, listen up guys. He says follow me. He says deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Found, let go of your idols. Let go of your own way apart from him, things that drive you besides, things that drive you more than Jesus, things that you love more than Jesus. Begin to submit yourself and allow your heart to love him more. On the other side of letting go of our sandcastles, they're, that are gonna get washed away anyways, regardless, is the loving embrace of the one who says to you and to I, follow me. And that's the call this morning for every one of us. Build your house on that solid foundation. Trust him completely because honestly, everything else is sand. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for your word this morning. Jesus, we're thankful that you have warned us of the storm. We're so thankful that you've given us your spirit that we are not alone in this, God. We're so thankful that you're giving us an opportunity to examine our hearts. Spirit of God, I ask you to move through every heart in this room this morning. Would you permeate, would you work, and would you reveal motivations of people's hearts that they would know you, that they would trust you, that they would love you, God. Would every one of us have an opportunity this morning to examine our heart and to ask you to realign our motivations, to realign our focus for obedience. God, may we love you more. We trust you, may we trust you more. 
those who believe but doubt, help them in their unbelief. Those who love but struggle with love, would you reveal your ferocious and immense love for them, God? Would they be drawn into your loving arms, into your loving presence as a good shepherd, Lord? I ask for every heart this morning that they would turn to you and examine, examine where they might have fallen and get up and run into your arms, God. Thank you for the, the joy of your obedience. Thank you for your, your statutes. Thank you for what you've done for us on the cross, that we're adopted into your family as sons and daughters beloved by God, and that now you've prepared us for good works that you might walk in them, that we might walk in them. Thank you, God, for the desire and the ability that you give us to do that which is right. Align our hearts' motivations. Holy Spirit, align our hearts' motivations in Jesus' name. If you need prayer for any reason, go ahead and come forward. The team would love to pray with you. Oh Lord, my God, you are my shepherd, my rock, you are my fortress and my shield. You're the defender of my heart, oh Lord, my God, you are my shepherd, my rock, you are my fortress and my shield, you're the defender.
Lord, as a church right now, we pray for every person, maybe those that were not willing to come out or those that are watching us online, families that we know that are going through difficult issues, someone that maybe is going through a season of chronic sickness or illness. Right now, as a church, we join in faith and we thank you, God, so much that every need, God, that any person might face, that it would be brought to you, that it would be brought to your Lordship. No matter what storm anybody is facing, we thank you. We thank you that there we find out what we are standing on. And we pray, we pray that if anyone is going through that shaking, anyone's going through that tough, difficult time, and there's things that are beating against their house, there are things that are, that are coming over them, God, and flooding, God, maybe even their home or what's happening, God, in their personal life. We pray, we pray that you would put them higher, God, that you would put them upon that rock in Jesus' mighty name. God, where there is illness, we pray for your healing power to touch those people, to touch those homes in Jesus' mighty name. Where marriages are shaking, where there's got tension between family members, we pray, God, for peace. We pray for reconciliation. We pray for healing and restoration. God, where there is debt, where there is fear, where there is, God, trouble, we pray, God, for you to resolve those things as those individuals come to you in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you so much for your peace that is greater than any storm. We thank you for your foundation that is greater than any storm. And we pray, we pray for one another and we pray for every person that might be needing right now, might be needing your peace, might be needing God an encounter with you, might be needing them to be placed upon your rock. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and we thank you God, we thank you. I wanna bring a need to you that we can pray for. Uh, our dear brother Alex Antipov, we have been praying for him as a church for a very long time. He's got a few things with his health that are going on, one of which is diabetes, and it's kind of affecting a lot of other things in his life. His wife reached out this morning. He was not doing well all night. They took him to the hospital. I don't know uh, the details of how he's doing right now, but his wife did reach out and ask that we would pray. Um, if there is a serious need that you have, uh, whether in your own life or in your family life, um, you, could, you could raise your hand. And those people that are standing next to you, we do this on Tuesdays when we pray. If you have a serious need that you are facing or someone's facing in your family, you can raise your hand. And right where you are, people are going to just surround you. And we're going to pray for you and pray for Alex and Tipa. You got a hand, Zach, I see your hand. If there's any other hands that are here, if there's a need that you have, this family right here, I want you to pray for this family. I see a hand in the back. I want you to look, raise your hand higher. Raise your hand higher. You see that hand right there in the back? I want some, some ladies, please, come up to her. Come on, let's begin to pray. God, we thank you right now. We pray for Alex in Jesus' mighty name. These many years of his health struggle and issues that he's been having in his body, God, we pray right now that you will touch him in Jesus' mighty name. Holy Spirit, help him. Lord, strengthen him. Bring healing into his life. I thank you, God, for his wife, Tamara. I thank you for Alex. I pray for their family. God, that in this difficult time they have been in, that you would just strengthen them, that your Holy Spirit would surround them. God, that you would bring comfort to them, that you would bring inner strength to them that their faith would not be shaken, but would stand firm upon your promises and your word. We pray, God, that in this storm that they have been facing, that your peace would come in Jesus' mighty name, that they would not fear no evil, that they would not doubt your goodness, that they would not stand away from your faith 
and your promises. We pray that you would touch Alex's body, that you would heal him in Jesus' mighty name. Thank God, I thank you for the power of your blood. I thank you for the power of what you have accomplished for us. And I bless him. I bless Alex in Jesus' mighty name. Where he is right now, God, heal him. Touch him. Raise him up and strengthen him. We pray as a church and we believe that your blood has not lost power. That what you've accomplished, it has not faded away. And we ask you, we ask you that you would strengthen his body. Strengthen his mind. Strengthen every organ. Strengthen his immune system. Bring healing into his body. We choose to believe that you and resurrect. And we pray, God, for your resurrection power to touch Alex's body in Jesus' mighty name. No matter what need we are facing right now, every person with a hand lifted, believing for a miracle, God, we pray, split that seed. Let that wall come down. Do what only you can do. We serve the God for whom nothing is impossible. And we pray, God, let your mountains move. Let the mountains move in these individuals' lives. We pray in Jesus' name. You are greater, God, and we believe. 